Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Of course. So, Matthew, you can control the mutes. I'm sorry? You can go ahead and control the muting. All right. I believe we're live. Live, Good, evening, everyone. Everyone. Good evening. My name is David Lozano, and I am the Executive Artistic Director of Academia Theater. And I'm proud to co-present this Q&A, New Policies to Support the Protest, with three other black and brown Dallas theater companies, Soul Rep Theater, Teatro Dallas, and Bishop Arts Theater Center. And we are honored to host our three guests, Sarah McCuria and John Fullenweider from Mothers Against Police Brutality and Pastor Frederick Haynes III from Friendship West Baptist Church. Sarah John and Pastor Haynes have been working for years against police brutality. Their tireless work combined with tremendous courage and resilience and passion from the protesters in the past two weeks have brought the city of Dallas to an unprecedented moment. As of last night, 10 out of 14 Dallas City Council members have committed to divesting in the Dallas Police Department. We're going to hear from our guests about their 10 point plan called 10 New Directions for Public Safety and Positive Community Change, which was requested by Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins and then presented to Judge Jenkins, Mayor Johnson and City Manager TC Broadnax. This live discussion is for all of you out there watching. It's for you to better understand the 10 point plan or how divesting in police works. So please feel free to send us your questions comments or feedback in the comment section of this live feed. We'll also be leaving some important links and information in that feed in the comment section. So to kick things off and to ask the first question, I'm going to pass the mic to Anika McMillan from Soul Rep Theater. You take it, Anika. Good evening and thank you, David. Uh, this question is for John. John, the renewed attention to defund the police has come out of the recent cruel killing of George Floyd. In what ways can the 10 point plan address the use of deadly force? So, okay, uh, thanks Anika and thanks everybody that's listening and, and uh, Teatro Dallas and uh, Caramia and Bishop Arts Theater and Soul Rep Theater for uh, getting involved in setting this thing up and I hope we'll be able to partner as we go along. Um, a lot of people don't realize that um, the use of deadly force or deadly police violence in America is quite common. Uh, there's about a thousand people a year that are killed by the police in America. And depending on what year that is, it's somewhere between six and 10% of all gun homicides. And then of course you have the deaths like of Mr. Floyd and uh, Tony Timpa in Dallas and uh, Alan Simpson years ago from chokeholds and various kinds of suffocation. Um, the, in spite of the uh, uh, pervasiveness of this, uh, over the past five years, uh, 5,000 East in America, uh, there's very few prosecutions, very little accountability. Uh, maybe there's seven or eight prosecutions a year and, and less than half of that uh, convictions. So in spite of, despite all of the movement that we've had over the past few years, the, the accountability for policing in America is very almost statistically insignificant. Uh, it, the fact remains that a police officer can do anything to you in this country, even kill you. And 99 and a half times out of 100, not one thing will happen to them. The city of Dallas has one of the worst records of any police department in the country on this. Uh, from the early 1970s, when an officer, Daryl Kane, was convicted of killing Santos Rodriguez until 2018 uh, when uh, Amber Geiger uh, shot Botham John to death and she was indicted and convicted. In that whole half century, there were no other convictions despite hundreds of police killings. And the killings in Dallas are, are not different than the famous ones. You know, uh, Clinton Allen unarmed shot seven times, once at close range in the back. Uh, Jason Harrison shot five times, twice in the back for holding a screwdriver on his own front porch. 
and the list goes on. And so uh, the approach that we're taking now has two major factors. The first is trying to get a handle on deadly force. And the second is trying to increase investment in, the, in things that improve the life of the community and actually make people feel safe and make them safe besides the presence of armed police. So we, the deadly force standard in America, there is no standard. Uh, each department, each of the 18,000 law enforcement agencies in this country have their own deadly force policies. They all roughly go with how the, uh, the perception of the officer. I feared for my life. And that's what you usually hear them say. And it's generally been a get out of jail ticket, right? Uh, so you, it goes to their perception and their motivation for taking the shot, right? So what we're interested in is getting more specific restrictions on deadly force so that you don't have to worry about what the, where you have to use deadly force and you wouldn't normally have to. Like if you chase someone alone, go on a foot chase alone, you might be, you might be pushing. There's really no need to use deadly force on them. In Europe, where the, in England, where the cops don't carry guns, no police officers get killed by a knife. It's not a, it's shooting unarmed people. So don't tell me you fear for your life. Back up and call for, uh, a call for other officers to help you. And by doing that, uh, they were still on patrol when their indictment came down. And so the, the only reason we've gotten any indictments is that the police department said, oh, we're not going to tolerate this and we're going to uh, charge Christopher Hess and pick him up. That didn't even happen. It did happen in Botham John's case and it did happen in Santos Rodriguez's case. But in no other case over a half century in Dallas have we had any accountability in the use of deadly force. And so that's our, the idea is to tighten it up and make it where you can't be, uh, you, the, the protesters don't want to be placated by some sweet talking about how, oh yeah, uh, we value black lives too, but we're not changing anything we're doing, you know? Uh, so that's, that's the gist of our, our, our uh, thinking on uh, restriction of deadly force. Um, good evening, everybody. This is Sara Cardona. I'm, from, I'm the executive director of Teatro Dallas. Um, I have a question for you, Sarah Mokuria. Um, all across the nation, there's a wide discussion about defunding the police. Could you talk a little bit about what that means specifically for Dallas and um, uh, some of the programs that you have listed in this 10 point plan, um, why you've chosen some of the, the, the programs in terms of investing, reinvesting in community. Uh, so what's, what's the plan specifically for Dallas? Thank you all so much for hosting this. Um, I am honored to be in the presence of some of my favorite theaters uh, the place that I go to, my family goes to for inspiration, for knowledge, for um, to be pushed, to grow. And um, I believe that um, institutions like you all are uh, the alternatives to the violence that we see in our community. So when, when, when we hear people say defund the police, um, and it seems, um, People discuss it as if it's uh, something that cities don't know how to do. Well, the arts organizations can, I think all of you could say deep um, the police. Um, and it, uh oh, something's going on. Um, can you all hear me? Listen, uh, Katarmia and Bishop Arts Theater and Solar Arts Theater for uh, getting involved in setting I'm going to mute for a second. Going on. Can I continue? Um, I think people are jumping on. If you're jumping on, can you just mute your your mic so I don't hear the feedback of myself and others? Thank you. So um, when we talk about defunding, what I was I was saying is that arts organizations know more than anybody. Arts organizations, art and culture organizations, libraries, rec centers, we we defund these programs all of the time. And when we, uh, so, so cities 
how to defund programs. The, the, the question is, it, the question of this moment, in my opinion, is why do we continue pouring investment into a system that is proving that it doesn't work? So when we want to, um, the goal is for us to um, address violence in our community. The goal is to address violence in our imagination and our scope of how we, um, how we respond to violence, what we do. And so when we say defund the police, we're saying 60% of, of the budget, the city's budget is going into policing to solve public safety issues. And they have not been able to solve public safety issues. So let's invest in alternative solutions. And the thing that we, we mentioned um, in, in this 10 new directions are some of the things that uh, we think would be good investments, uh, good investments into the community, but they are not a uh, comprehensive list. I think what has to happen between now and um, when when the budget is written is that all of Dallas needs to be brought into this conversation. And and I think that um, I I think that the brilliance of our city, every age group, and I think that organizations like your theater should be part of this process in gathering what communities need to actually feel safe. What do communities need to actually thrive? And so when when we this these ten new directions, the points that we bring up in, tor in in terms of what should be invested in are not a comprehensive list. They are they are um, just the beginning. And I hope that our, our city leadership um, chooses to broaden broaden this conversation and bring more people in so that seniors can say, um, these are the things that we need to feel safe. Uh, youth can say, these are the things that we need to feel safe. And every constituent across the city can um, reimagine what we could do with $500 million to make our community more vibrant and more safe. So when we say defund, defund the police, what we're saying is uh, have the courage to invest in uh, new and alternative solutions and stop continuing to pour money into an institution that is proven over and over again that it doesn't work. Thank you so much, Sarah. We appreciate that. Good evening, everybody. My name is Teresa Coleman Wash. I am the Executive Artistic Director for the Bishop Arts Theater Center. And Pastor Haynes, this question is for you, it's a two-part question. So can you describe the impact of the history of unaccountable police violence on people's lives? And what is the impact on our community on the deepest level from the killings year after year and nothing seems to stop? Pastor Haynes, are you there? What is the impact? I've been disabled. I You've can't, been disabled. I've Matthew, been disabled. Can you, okay, Matthew. Oh, now you can hear me, but you don't want to see me, and I understand. <laughs> we can we can hear you. Matthew, is it can you help us with this video? There you okay, go. We there see I you. am. Okay. I thought you were sending me a message. I understand. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let me express my appreciation. I'm with uh, Sarah in saying how much we appreciate uh, the work of the arts. And if you let me testify right quick, my father died when I was 14 years old. I grew up in San Francisco. And I can honestly testify, had it not been for a job working in what was called the CETA program back then, you all are too young to know anything about that. And where, where, where the city created, the government rather created jobs for young people in the summer. And we also had in San Francisco in the Fillmore district, uh, an arts program where, you know, 
I got my acting chops on. And so, Teresa, you don't know about my acting skills, but I have acting skills from back in the day. But I'm letting you know right now that I can speak for my friends who I was running with, myself. If it had not been for the job in the arts, I would not be where I am right now. There, the, my father had just died and I was ready to take another route. And so I uh, appreciate so much uh, what you do. And that is why we are calling for investing in the community uh, mm -hmm. and defunding the police. Uh, I'll just give you this by way of history and what you uh, asked me. Number one, we all know that uh, the history of policing is rooted in the slave patrols. The slave patrols were never designed to serve and protect black people. The slave patrols criminalized black people because they had also been not only objectified, but merchandise. And so with that being the case, the slave patrols played into the economy of the South. Again, the merchandising of black bodies, but also criminalizing in order to protect, you know, whites, especially what white women from these brutes. And so you have the slave patrols, which policed black people. And so when you look at the DNA of policing, the DNA of policing goes back to the slave patrols. And so because you have a toxic and oppressive root system, you're inev inevitably going to produce what? Fruit that reflects the root. And the fruit that reflects the root is consistent with racism in the United States of America. So policing has a bad and toxic and oppressive beginning. And unfortunately, when I hear stuff like, you know, oh, we just have a few bad apples here, most are good. Yeah, we have so many bad apples that if your apple tree was producing this many bad apples, sooner or later, you're gonna have to ask yourself, what's wrong with the tree? What's wrong with the orchard? And so we're saying, and I love the terms that uh, Sarah was using, can we have the courage to reimagine what public safety looks like? We have to have that kind of courage because right now it is rooted in a system that is designed to be oppressive. It's designed for social control. It's not designed for public safety. Uh, John said something earlier that, you know, I'm still tripping on because I was reading yesterday or Monday, I should say, I was reading about the fact that in London, only 10% of police officers even carry a gun. They don't have a wild, wild west culture there. And so you have 10% who are carrying a gun. So how many officer involved shootings do you have in London? And London has a much larger population than Dallas does. And so it's something for us to consider. So the history of policing black bodies in this country is rooted in the slave patrols. It has also been tied into the lynching system so that whenever we see pictures of lynchings that took place in this country, it's not, it's, it's, it's not uncommon that there were police around because the police were a part of that system of oppression, that system of social control. So when we talk about what's going on right now, we are talking about not bad apples, we are talking about a bad system. Uh, I believe it was Monday that uh, the author of uh, the wonderful book, uh, 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 oh my God, I can't think of her name right now, she'll kill me. But anyway, she wrote a book that talked about uh, the caste system of the criminal justice system, the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander, there it is. And Michelle Alexander Monday said the system of policing is designed to work the way that it is, it is working right now. So we see it as a broken system when in reality, it's really working the way it was originally designed to work. It has not changed and because it has not changed, we are calling for reimagining what this should look like. Why? Because it has, to answer the second part of your question, it keeps us in a constant state of PTSD. Uh, one of the things that has been 
heartbreaking for me is to hear the response of black mothers to George Floyd in his last moments after saying, I can't breathe, he's calling for his mother. And I have every conversation I've had with the black mother to this day, that conversation has reflected that black mother saying he was calling for me because that could have been my child. And so there's a, there's a, there, there's a PTSD that we experience uh, in this country every time the news cycle reveals another black body has been killed. Not only that, uh, I'll be honest with you, whenever I am driving and I am in proximity to a police car, even if they are in front of me, I'm driving less than the speed limit. I can't tell you, I'm immediately thinking this could easily be my last few hours of living. That's too much trauma to live with as a human being to, to basically drive and think if something happens, and he decides to pull me over, am I done? And I'm not the only one who feels that way. And so on the one level, answering your question, we've got to keep in mind that the whole system of policing is rooted in the slave patrols that criminalize black people and merchandise black people. And at the same time, it has produced these constant killings have produced this PTSD that exists in our community. Um, this is Sara Cardona again from Teatro Dallas. Thank you, Pastor. I um, wanna, now we're bringing out many, many things. Um, so I wanna ask a question that's specifically about accountability and convictions and um, moving to a, a, a place of justice. So this question is for uh, Sarah. What role do the police associations play in, in bringing police to justice? Um, what are the things that if we if we are recommending policies, um, how are, and these policies are very specific to help uh, you know um, guide more accountability. Uh, but what are some of the things that can be done um, in terms of these other structures that are in place uh, to make sure that that police are held accountable? How do we move to uh, to to enforcement? So I'm going to answer that in a, a couple of different ways. Uh, you know, resoundingly, what this moment is telling us is that policing is not working, right? The policing as a system does not work for us. It works as it is intended to work, but it does not work for us as a community. And so we have to shift away from, from policing as um, a part of our culture and, and our society. As it relates to accountability, we have, we, Mothers Against Police Brutality has long um, pushed uh, for incremental reforms that are included in uh, this, these 10 new directions as a way to um, help create accountability, transparency, and quite frankly, it's harm reduction, right? It's, it's harm reduction. But this moment affords us an opportunity to move beyond harm reduction and into a space of imagination. And I, I say that because um, you know, often, how many times have has John been on a um, Zoom or uh, Pastor Haynes, myself, or so many others, um, and we've all said training and body cameras and different things, and, and yet and still, we're all fearful when we see police officers. We're all still scared. We shouldn't be funding an institution that hurts and scares us. We should be brave enough to invest in alternatives. And, and, and people say, well, what if we fail? It won't be the first time, right? I mean, if we, if we 
if if society, um, if this country had said, well, we should not free enslaved people because we don't know what will happen when they are free, you know, then like if that is the logic and the thinking that we use, where would we be, you know? We, we shouldn't allow um, the right to vote. We shouldn't allow for women to have jobs or to um, have bank accounts because we don't know what will happen to society, right? Like we cannot allow fear to continue to be the driving force in our decision-making. And as uh, in the last two decades, uh, as society has moved to more data-driven decision-making, the data is clear on what role policing plays in our society. So when we talk about DPA, uh, or the Dallas Police Association, and the role that they play in, in accountability, they, they are not part of that role. They, they actually play the exact opposite role. Who uh, created a, a circle of prayer around Amber Geiger uh, after shooting Botham John in his own apartment and failing to render aid. That was the Dallas Police Association. Who offered expert testimony that it was justifiable for officers to run over Fred Bradford Jr., back back over his body, breaking every bone, dragging him, failing to render aid, and um, who, who, who testified in court that, that that is justifiable actions um, on, on the uh, part of police? That was the Dallas Police Association. So um, they are the antithesis. Uh, all, all of these um, police unions are the antithesis to what we are fighting for. And uh, I think um, a bold statement was made in the, the special council meeting held the other day here in, in Dallas via Zoom. And it was made by um, council member Kleiman who challenged his other uh, colleagues to stop accepting money from the Dallas Police Association. And, and you know, the FBI doesn't have a lobbying body that, um, that pays different, um, pays campaign contributions to different elected officials. We would find that to be a, a, a gross miscarriage of, um, of our system of, of transparency, of neutrality. And so I think that we have to remove the chokehold that the Dallas Police Association has had over uh, our elected officials for decades. I think um, John wanted to add something to this idea of, um, you know, the difference between just um, giving a policy recommendation and then actually having some structure, as you're saying, to enforce it and dealing with um, this, this system that is obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's, it has built in racism. So go ahead, John. I just, I just wanted to uh, build on what Sarah is saying. Um, to, to have a new approach to policing, uh, which is to divest from the way we police now and invest in other aspects of community safety. This is a process that doesn't happen overnight. And so we have to, we have to hold the police accountable for the policing they've been doing and that they're doing now. And um, most people don't realize it, but until about 2017, uh, uh, the DA's office did very superficial investigations, if any into police shootings. They regularly just took what they called the jacket from the, from the police department's investigation, which almost uh, 99 and a half times out of 100 uh, uh, cleared the officer of any wrongdoing. They put him back on the force and say, take your time. You know, uh, We know you're gonna no bill it anyway. And in uh, 2014, uh, Craig Washington actually established a unit within the DA's office uh, at the urging of Muslims Against Police Brutality and other groups that were working on this issue to actually do investigations of police shootings. This may sound like a minor, not a big dramatic change, 
and they didn't do anything for a couple of years. But beginning in 2017, with in, in uh, uh, I think it was in with the uh, Jordan Edwards shooting, we saw that that office began to make a difference. They did do an independent investigation, and we got our first indictment and conviction in Dallas County. And the, the same happened with the death of uh, Jose Cruz uh, by an off-duty uh, Farmers Branch Carrollton police officer. He was indicted and convicted. I bring this up not because two indictments and convictions are that much, but when you get some of these uh, reforms, they do lead to more accountability. And so it was in place pretty well uh, for the Botham John killing. And that was our second indictment and conviction in uh, 50 years. The other thing is that because they didn't used to investigate any police shootings independently, we and they changed it because that wasn't working, right? It was letting everybody off the hook for a shooting uh, routinely. Because of that, we have some shootings, many shootings between 2000, let's say, and the, and the shooting of Botham John that were horrendous shootings, uh, like the couple that I've mentioned, Clinton Allen, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, shooting of Jason Harrison, everybody that's shot in the back, that's a suspicious shooting, right? And none of them were given any real investigation. So one of the points when you all read, when people read the plan, they'll see a point that says we would want a review of all officer involved shootings since 2000. And the point is they might find some criminal activity that, that was overlooked in the uh, non-investigation prior to this unit. And they also might find uh, policies and practices that could have been different and would have saved the person's life. Like if only Amber Geiger had said, hmm, let me step back a minute before shooting. And, you know, uh, and even if it were her apartment, call for backup, you know. Uh, she only lived across the street from the police station anyway. And so the, the unaccountability in the past cannot just be forgotten. And here's a good example. Uh, Amber Geiger used to claim often that her mentor was an officer named Martin Rivera. He'd also turned out to be her lover and they were trading texts that night, you know. But she often said, he's the one that trained me. He's my partner. He taught me how to be a policeman. Well, in 2007, Martin Rivera shot an unarmed black kid named Brandon Washington and got completely, you know, like all of them, no charges, no indictment, no trial, no conviction, no nothing. And he went on to train the officer and she specifically named him as her mentor that killed both of John. So the past is not like the distant past. It's like a hand from the recent past reaching out and grabbing you by the throat. And so we need a reckoning with the things that have happened in the Dallas Police Department. And then we need to find other methods uh, to hold the police accountable while they're policing, you know, and uh, the police function has got to be uh, held more accountable. And, and it doesn't take away the idea of moving to a, a humane system where policing is minimized and you have less encounters with an armed police officer uh, doesn't uh, negate the need to hold these cops responsible now, because I'll, I'll just close with this. Every police department in this country has uh, an officer like the man who killed George Floyd. And the Dallas Police Department has dozens, if not. Uh, we found uh, many officers have been, uh, uh, were found to have racist social media postings, you know, uh, and, and, and just uh, people, uh, uh, young people, young black men in the city could name 20 of them right now, like Derek Chauvin. And so we we need to, another way of doing accountability is if you have officers with multiple complaints, you pull them aside. Maybe you disarm them for a year and just see how it goes, you know. Uh, but the idea behind changing policing is to reduce encounters with armed police and lift up the humanity in the community. But in the meantime, we can't, we, we have got, the, the council has to get serious about holding this department accountable. Thank you, John. This is Anika again with Soul Rep Theater Company. And I have a question for Pastor Haynes. Um, Pastor Haynes, we of course are theater companies. Um, that is our craft. Um, do you have any suggestions as you're, given your experience as a pastor and as we heard earlier today as a former actor on how we can better educate our communities on police reform and our role as artists. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, and for the, your acknowledgement of my 
uh, acting credentials. Please let Teresa Wash know I'm available. Uh, number one, I would hope that we would partner to advocate as we look at reimagining public safety and including the theater arts district as a part of public safety, that we would partner in advocating that when we are in this budget cycle, that we say that the theater arts, that's a part of public safety. When our children, teenagers have an opportunity to discover talents and gifts, that means if I'm doing this, I can't, I don't have time to do that. And I'm creating a new family for myself, uh, as it were. I'm, I'm gaining new friends. I'm, I'm receiving exposure beyond uh, my block, as it were. And so uh, the first thing I, I would love to, and I, and I, and I volunteer, you know, uh, those in the black church community that we partner with you, we to advocate that we basically say that public safety includes opportunities for young people to have opportunities in the arts, in theater. That's the first thing. Second thing I'll say is that I would hope that by way of, you know, and I'm, I wanna say this right quick because I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we heard what Sarah said earlier that there's a lot of brilliance in Dallas that allows us to take flight on the wings of imagination to say, to use this moment where the, the, the winds of change are blowing at hurricane force. Let's use this moment to, again, imagine how we, how, how, how we create safe communities, how we create uh, communities that are healthy, because I promise you there's a correlation between unhealthy communities and what? Communities where there is quote unquote violence and interactions with police that are always gonna come out unhealthy. And so I would also encourage the arts community to understand that you're not limited to just the arts. You are a part of the Dallas community and therefore there is a, even a responsibility, a need. Who is better at using imagination than artsy people? And so I'm simply saying, I hope we can have conversations where we lift up the arts and talk about, this is what public safety looks like. After all, you engage in creativity all of the time. And so in light of the creative genius and juices that, that, that the creator has given to those who are in the arts, I think this is a beautiful time for, the, for, for those in the arts to say, well, let us imagine and reimagine what public safety looks like. Because again, that's a part of that pool of brilliance in Dallas that we can all tap into and use this moment to reimagine and recreate what public safety looks like. This for me is a time where we're saying, we ain't going back to normal because normal was whack. And so since we're not going back to normal, let us have the imagination to create a brand new normal. And it just hit me. Y'all imagine all the time. So let's imagine together what, 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 what this thing can look like. And then let's partner in advocating to make sure that we, what? Prioritize in the budget funding for for the arts and for the theater district. Thank you Thank so you. much, Pastor Haynes. I, I appreciate that. That's a it's, a, it's a powerful vision. I think the flip side of this tip point plan is the reinvestment part and this pool of brilliance you're talking about. And that the flip side of, of this so-called police reform is, is rebuilding our city. And because we ask ourselves, what do people need in order to find their purpose in life, be healthy, and to have a fulfillment, to achieve fulfillment in their lives. Well, they need everything. And that's what I appreciate about this 10 point plan is a vision to provide health, education, uh, housing, and all kinds of support 
through um, reinvesting what goes to the police into the communities. And uh, I would I want to add one thing about the the theater companies and specifically the theater companies here. We have two black and brown theater companies, and we come from the the Latino and the black neighborhoods. And this is our way of connecting with the young people out there throughout Dallas. And so it's our ability through our stories, our uh, teaching techniques, and our curricula to reach not just young people, but adults. And we're also working in neighborhoods. So I wanted to, um, and, and the last thing I say, I want to say is we really in, instill vitality in our communities through our work. It allows people to feel good. And that's one of the things about, um, about living a healthy life is feeling good about yourself and feeling good about your culture. And that's what these black and brown companies are doing. I want to open that up to the other groups uh, from Jeff Hurst. He asks, could the artists elaborate on the ways they impact our communities in terms of public safety? Uh, what would be the results, the results of additional funding, particularly for your organizations? Um, so uh, how about Anika? Well, I want to hear from all three groups, but Anika, why don't you answer that question? And then we'll hear from uh, Sara and then Teresa. Great, thank you, David. Thank you for that question, Jeff. Um, I think um, as we look to defund the police, which is a terminology that we're using now and, and correct that, um, as we're discovering, we should reinvest in things that are preparing people, that are inspiring our community, that are creating a more healthy environment for our city and our citizens. And of course, the arts accomplishes that. Um, like many um, arts organizations of color, and we traditionally are underfunded um, and you know, lack a lot of resources in larger arts organizations. So I would hope that moving forward um, that some of this increased investment that we might see uh, might be to ensure that organizations like ours whose missions specifically are to uh, better our communities, to educate people on our, the experiences of our people throughout the diaspora, um, will be valued more in our city. We have to, money needs to go to, towards things that are valuable to our city. And we all feel like um, we as arts organizations, um, we as artists um, provide quite a bit of uh, beauty um, to our artistic landscape. And it is our responsibility um, to continue to strengthen organizations so that we can do more not only through performances and supporting local artists, as Pastor Haynes shared earlier, employing young people, employing local artists, developing new arts patrons, developing that next generation of artists themselves, um, educating, going into the schools that are struggling that do not have arts programs, allowing us to really do that at a more robust level, um, I think we'd see a different community. I, I agree completely, Anika. And um, to add to um, some of the points that you mentioned in terms of, obviously we work a lot with youth, all of us do education, workforce training, because um, all of us are products of having come through the arts and having had someone invest in us. And, um, but I, I think one thing that's very important is that um, our groups historically have also been intersectional. So we are a pivot point for bringing people together in the community. And I you know I'm a product of the 80s and I remember very well, and this city was a divide and conquer type of situation where it was, um, where, you know, uh, black communities and Latino communities were historically pitted against each other. They had to fight for resources. And I really think um, the arts, because it's an experience that puts um, individual stories and on a human scale, is a way in which uh, people are able to come together. It actually is a connector. So um, on top of you know education of youth and workforce training, what I would say very specific to our organizations is our abilities to um, bring diverse communities together to strengthen. In fact, exactly what we're doing, I would say is a model. We can model these types of situations and that happens 
like at the at the ground level. So, you know, just anecdotally, I mean, on our stages, we have always had, um, whether they're the kids programs or the adults, adults, uh, people who normally don't necessarily come together, working together and having these kind of interactions. And I think that's, that's huge. And I'm, you know, I mean, the arts in general do that, but I think when it's your mission statement to do that, when it's your goal to do that, and it's intentional. And I think that um, what's, what's really difficult is our groups uh, are, are in the business of making great art, but we're also in the business of healing our communities and telling our stories and working very directly um, for a, a goal of improvement, social impact. So when we're not funded well, it, it, it hurts our ability to amplify the things that we're already doing which are very mission driven, they're very intentional, it's relevant, it's, it, it has a purpose. It's not just entertainment. We always talk about art being for life's sake and not just for the sake of entertainment. I'm sorry, Teresa, go ahead. That's okay, that's okay. I mean, you know, we have, at the Bishop Arts Theater Center, we have never um, been a traditional, considered ourselves a traditional theater company. We've always touted ourselves as a neighborhood resource center, whatever that looks like. And so uh, Pastor Haynes is absolutely right. We are so much more than a quality of life issue. We are a public safety issue. When we're taking kids off the streets and placing them in a productive, constructive, controlled environment during the extended workday and during the summer months, we become a public safety issue. And so um, I certainly, I think uh, the four, organizations, theater companies that are represented here, we ha have always considered ourselves as a public, you know, a, a public safety issue, but educating our elected officials and the public at large, you know, is, is a different story. We have over 800 people that are attending this webinar. And yes, theater companies are more, much more than uh, a place where you can go to escape or see a great show. We're literally taking kids off the streets. And so I think that that should be, um, that should be uh, definitely top of mind for everybody. I have, this is Anika again. I have a quick question for John regarding the police unions. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can keep police unions from curtailing the defunding of the police? It's a very important question because Every single, uh, as Sarah mentioned, the, the Dallas Police Association and the Fraternal Order of Police nationally have opposed every single reform uh, that's ever been <laughs> proposed. And they have opposed all attempts at, at any kind of critical oversight of what they're doing. The, the Dallas Police Association's endorsement in a local election uh, is probably except for the real estate council, no endorsement is, is sought more uh, earnestly. Uh, they want that on there. And when they make a, uh, an endorsement, you drive by, you see the political sign, it says endorsed by Dallas police. It doesn't say Dallas Police Association's political action committee or anything like that. So anybody that uh, is, is a traditionally law and order type or, oh yeah, well the police are endorsing him. So I'm gonna, uh, that's why they want that. And then sometimes it gets you officers uh, walking the precincts in your district saying vote for so-and-so. So it's a very valuable endorsement. Uh, and we've encouraged, uh, I think Sarah mentioned it, but we've long encouraged the city council and others to uh, depoliticize the police. Don't, don't ask for that endorsement and don't take it and don't take contributions from them. If an individual officer wants to volunteer for you, that's one thing. But for the it's not like city employees don't have uh, First Amendment rights, et cetera. But the only city employees who are authorized to kill you when they think it's uh, necessary are represented by the Dallas Police Association in these elections. And uh, uh, that has a tendency. Uh, there's no way that that doesn't color the judgment uh, and policy making around that horseshoe. Uh, they're the ones that, uh, you know, a, a bad sh shooting comes in and they're likely to, their first thought's gonna be, no, nah, the DPA is pretty good, they endorse me. And uh, that's politics, and I'm not saying it means that they're 
anybody's heart is bad. You know, I don't care what they really feel inside, but an endorsement and money when you're trying to get elected, uh, why do they do it? Good government? I don't think so. So they, they need to be exposed. They, they think they are the police department. They've run off several chiefs through the years and um, they're not. They're the White Police Officers Association mainly. And the department itself so divided that you have the Black Police Officers Association and, and the Latino Officers Association. So uh, the idea is that to not have a, a politicized in the, in the electoral sense police department, you know, keep it, keep neutral toward it. If you're on the, if you're sitting around that horseshoe and don't take money from them because you may have to sit, may have to decide what to do with one of their members who doesn't know how to police uh, respecting people's human rights. We have a general question for the panel um, from Courtney Sheree, who's asking, and I hope I pronounced her name right. Uh, can we look into communities that have already implemented some of these strategies and see how they executed it? Well, um, I I'll start with that. I think there are solutions across the country uh, that we can look at and across the world of other ways of um, addressing crime and violence. Um, but what, what I'll start with is saying that we can't keep looking to a violent system to get rid of violence in our community, right? We cannot keep continue to invest in a violent system um, to, to rid our community of violence. And especially over the last two weeks with the protests, you have seen that um, un instead of undoing um, uh, harm, the, the police have been creating harm uh, on, on the streets. And so um, there aren't any, there's, there's not a model city other than maybe Wakanda where everything is um, the way we want it to be. Um, but there are pieces um, that we can learn from other cities and, and we would have to go um, issue by issue from domestic violence to mental health, et cetera. And I think that we have uh, wonderful uh, staff at the city of Dallas who should be compiling those, those lists right now. We have research institutions across our, our city that should be compiling those, um, those examples right now. But more than that, uh, I wanna go back to trusting our community listening to our community. I think a lot about um, Jose Marti, who is a, a revolutionary and he, 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 he used to say, we import, and he's, uh, um, he, he used to say, we, we import wine from France, but we should be making our own palm wine. Why are we importing wine from Europe. When we have palms here, we can make our own wine. We should be making our own wine. And I say that to say, we need to have Dallas solutions to Dallas problems. And so we can look other places um, to, uh, as, um, as a starting point to see how other communities have solved issues. But communities in Dallas are solving their own issues without police. And so what we need to do is expand those, invest in them, and try them. You know, the, the beauty of the tech industry, it's, it's taken over so fast. You know, in, in my lifetime, I, I, I remember a time when I lived without the internet and without a cell phone, and now I can't live without either. Uh, they're part of every moment of my life. Um, but the way that the tech industry is able to move so fast is they have a mantra of fail faster try, invest, move fast, fail, and pivot. We need to have that type of mentality. Let's try different things. Let's, let's try a few years of over-investing in arts, culture, and mental health solutions and under-investing in police and see what happens, you know? And, and we continue to invest in police despite um, violent crime spikes, you know, we continue to, even though they're failing, we continue to invest in them. Let's do the opposite and see what happens. We don't need to have fear 
about uh, what could happen when we actually invest in people. And I, you know, I really appreciated the conversation earlier about um, what these organizations can do um, as public safety uh, strategies. And I can say personally, as a, uh, a, a student of Booker T. Washington, I worked out my trauma on the stage at Booker T. And um, unfortunately, uh, to the dismay of my theater teacher. Um, but I, I work, you know, I was able to, I was able to channel things that I couldn't even speak about. I couldn't tell my story, but I was able to, um, through characters, find my own voice. And I was a project manager for a project called Translation in the Vickery Meadow neighborhood um, a few years back. And I remember a lot of the events that, which is considered a crime hotspot. Um, I remember police officers attending our events, one particular event called the Lucky Pot, where there were over 500 community members having a talent show and, and um, a um, potluck. And I remember the police officer saying to me, wow, you know, I, like I, I've arrested some of the, those students and I didn't know they had that talent, right? But you really can't know what kind of talent people have when you're pulling them over for the smell of marijuana, when you're arresting them, when you're yelling at them, when you're firing rubber bullets at them, when you're firing canisters at them. That, that doesn't cultivate the types of relationships that we need in, in our city and across our country. And I think that theaters provide a space for us not only to um, find ourselves, but also to understand others. So much of the pain and violence that we experience in our communities are driven by fear. And fear often is because we don't know. But um, you, know, you, can, you, you can go to a play about people that you don't know and feel their story and understand their story and understand why people make the decisions that they make. And so there are so many powerful ways uh, that theaters and um, the arts in general and so many other things um, are public safety intervention. So to sum that up, um, there isn't a model city to, to point to, but there are small interventions across the country that we can look at and we should be looking at. And um, we are done with the day where senior uh, dental services are pitted against rec center uh, passes or um, investments into the theaters. That's, that's done. We are not going to fight over crumbs anymore. We are taking back our money. That this is our money. This is this is this is our city, um, and we are uh, no longer sitting quiet. And and um, as as our money is is not invested in um, positive ways. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, I. Again, we're really looking at, like Sarah says, taking over our taxpayer money and so that we're not pitting services against each other. I want to bring up a question from Diane Hosey. She asks, what would it take to create that platform for our four theaters to provide these services and support for public safety? What support would we all need to make the case to city council that our theaters can serve safety? I think we need uh, our, our constituents and everyone out there to contact city council with this action plan that we put in the Zoom chat, as well as the Facebook chat, which is to write a cover letter that is personalized to the mayor and all city councils and saying that you support the 10 point plan to defund the police and reinvest in our communities. And in your cover letter, tell council that you want to support the BIPOC -B theaters such as Caramia Theater, Dathra Dallas, Bishop Arts, and Soul Rep to uplift our neighborhoods through increased funding for educational programs in neighborhoods, 
through community organizing and community building programs at our theaters, as well as supporting our main stage plays. All of our work is meant to uplift the lives of black and brown and really all people in Dallas and uplift the lives and the confidence we have in our own cultures and our native tongues. So if we follow this action plan and we specify in our cover letter what we want to support and if you support this kind of platform for POC theater uplifting the lives of our communities, the council will listen and it's gonna take a critical mass and it will also take people in different positions, it will take everyone. So, and it's important also to spread the word about um, this plan to your contacts. You may have 100, 200 contacts that you may want to reach out to. That's how we're going to make a difference by flooding the mayor and city council. I do want to, uh, I, I wanna ask two more questions before we wrap up. I did wanna give the opportunity to the theaters. Um, what do you think would support the case to city council that our theaters can support public safety? Well, I would, I would like to point out um, that, and I'm sure this is true for each of our organizations, that because historically we have um, been cut off from uh, sources of funding or have had to struggle for them, we are very resilient and excellent at partnerships, unconventional partnerships. And so all of us have partnered with entities that are already doing social service work. And so rather than just being on the track of producing art, um, you know, for example, Teatro Dallas has worked um, in the past with organizations such as Heart House that are working with incoming youth in Vickery Meadows, immigrant uh, communities. Um, we partnered with them in order to go for funding. Uh, we partner with, um, we've partnered with organizations that are providing um, arts to homeless families. Um, we, so, so as theaters, we've had to find ways to already work with the health industry, with the health system, with um, uh, institutions, whether they're educational, after school programs. So when we talk about how um, our organizations are actually helping mitigate problems in the community and providing um, safety, I think we can actually, you know, provide excellent testimonials as to our collaborative work within the communities. We step outside of our theater buildings all the time and we go out into spaces, non-conventional spaces, whether they're literally restaurants or libraries or parks or homeless shelters or hospitals. And all of us have been in those spaces producing work. So I think that's very important to point out that we have a distributive network that goes into all these different places. I echo what Sarah says, but in addition to that, I challenge everyone to look at public safety, safety in a diff, through a different lens. What does that really mean? It's not just public safety. We want our public to have accessibility, access to the arts, every citizen, every child, every household or what have you, we need to look at what creates a healthy, holistic um, community for a city. And that is by dismantling these systems um, such as defunding the police that are preventing equal access for all people to art, to quality education, to all of these things. So yes, the arts plays a role in enriching lives. No one can deny that, but I look forward to the day when everyone has access to the arts. And you know, it, it, and it, and, you know historically in Western society, it has become, it's been this elitist thing and that needs to be dismantled. So public safety is public, let's look at that as public access. And as uh, Pastor Haynes was saying earlier, how can our citizens feel safe to just be and have uh, and, and be equal contributors and uh, participants in our society. That is what public safety is. Exactly. Thank you so much for that, Anika. And, you know, the reality is we all have a track record. We've worked uh, with the Dallas Independent School District, City of Dallas Park and Recreation Center. On Tuesdays, pre-COVID, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we had senior citizens on our stage participating in a storytelling circle. And many of these seniors had stage three dementia. And 
they were part of music therapy and and um, again, a lot of um, workshops. And interestingly enough, what we found was that some of those seniors were being uh, weaned off some of their medication. So when you talk about um, access and, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we never really considered ourselves to be a, um, a traditional theater company and, this, and in this moment, that feels like a strength at this time. So I really uh, completely agree with Anika. We've got to change the paradigm into what we think public sa safety looks like. It is not a bunch of policemen on the streets policing, over-policing our uh, black and brown kids. Use us, we are a resource. I want, I want to add uh, a uh, I want to add a comment that is from um, the inclusive communities project and and it's, it says we need to fund all needed services in the city of Dallas and I do want to acknowledge that because I believe that is the vision of this 10 point plan and uh, it, and I want to uh, offer the floor to uh, to uh, I, any of our panelists, to talk anything about any other programs that you've seen or you would like to see or envision that could support your plan? So I'll just say um, quickly that the, the, the model so far has been um, criminalize homelessness to deal with uh, the unhoused population, criminalize poverty instead of dealing with um, the income inequality. And so this, this philosophy, this, this different way, this different approach that we are talking about is saying, recognize what the root cause issues in our communities are and, and find the right solutions for them. And so we know just off the top of, um, just, just top of mind, that that includes issues around housing, transportation, infrastructure, art and culture. We have to have a comprehensive viewpoint. And um, this is just a beautiful moment because instead of us over inflating, continuing to over inflate the police budget, we are now saying we can reimagine what our society and our community can look like and what actually keeps us safe, what actually are um, the right interventions for harm and violence and crime. And I think that um, none of us uh, should have the solution in the moment. It's going to take time and a process for us to all dig deeply into understanding uh, what these issues are and what the best solutions are. And um, we should have the courage to not be afraid uh, to, to fail uh, and, and, and pivot. And so um, I, I, I would say absolutely, David, that this is a, this is a comprehensive um, approach and we need to, to keep it that way. And uh, so I, I think that we, we are creating the road while we're walking it. We don't need to have all the solutions right now to know the way things are operating right now is not the solution. Thank you so much, Sarah. We're gonna be, we're close to wrapping up. I do want to quote one of uh, the comments. Public safety is feeling like you have institutions where you can share and fellowship in a safe space. I think that's important to create a city where we feel safe, where we can be creative and we can thrive. I want to uh, ask John this final question. Um, what are our next steps? And does it involve, uh, and I'm gonna combine a couple of questions. Um, what are our next steps? Because we had one person ask, do you recommend more downtown protests such as car caravans? And then what do we, how do we engage with council? Uh, thank you. 
on next steps, let me address first the, um, the 10 new directions here and the discussion we've had tonight. Um, it was the, the crisis of unaccountable police violence that broke this bubble over the budget. We've done a lot of budget work in the past and, and uh, just last year, the group Our City, Our Future did a good analysis of the budget and brought a lot of these issues up, but they weren't getting the traction because the crisis of public safety, which is uh, uh, that over-policing, racial profiling and police brutality are not only unjust, they're not making our communities safer, you know, and they make the whole city unjust. And they don't even relieve the anxiety of the uh, wealthy homeowner who still feels like they need to hire an off-duty policeman to guard their neighborhood. So the whole public safety model is, is really in crisis. And it was the violent crisis of police brutality that brought us to this point. So the 10 points address both aspects of this. They address unaccountable police brutality and violence, and they address a vision of a more humane and uh, uh, prosperous community for everybody. And looking at public safety, not as what do the police do, but how do we create personal and community well-being? And so because the document as we wrote it, not perfect of course, does address the two aspects of this crisis. We want, we, the first thing we'd like people to do is to download the document in PDF form, then write a short cover note saying you support it attach the document and then explain enough about yourself so that it doesn't look like a form letter. Like I'm, I'm involved with Teatro Dallas, I'm involved with Bishop Arts Theater or Crowder Mia or Soul Rep and I know the importance of the arts and I also support these 10 new directions and one new direction I support is more funding for the arts and less to uh, over police a neighborhood. And so that's something you can do is it's um, we begin with sort of low level activism is flooding the council with emails and the mayor on this. And then throughout the summer, uh, we want to engage the council directly. And this can be through uh, ongoing protests. I wouldn't tell anyone to stop protesting police brutality and systemic racism in this country because uh, whatever we do, we can always do a little more and we, we can't ever do enough on that front. But for people who want to get directly involved in the nuts and bolts of this budget process, we, I, I'm going to recommend that we uh, take our city, our future as sort of our umbrella and that we create, like the theater groups, go ahead and create the, the theater budget that you want out of OCA. And we're going to create the cuts that we see are important in the police department, you know, through MAPB and the other people that work on that. And then we come together with kind of a community budget as a, uh, as a budget that shows what we want and what we're not gonna settle for less for. And you may have enough uh, people who, who once they start getting demagogued on the crime issue, uh, they're not gonna cut the police department very much. I'm just a little real politic here, but even if they don't cut it, we want this. So give us parity, you know? Uh, and I think that, uh, I think the, we'll have more success uh, this time around on the budget. Uh, 10 council members say they're open to it. And uh, I think that that's a place to start. Uh, David said that he would put up on the, on the site uh, and our city, our future has it too. And we can put it up uh, on MAPB site as well, but easy access to the council via email. And if we could send those off and then if we could get the, the more active, uh, people involved with theater and the arts to join us in this idea of really a, an analyzing and attacking this budget. Because everything, uh, the other, and we, we want to reject the argument that, uh, oh, we're already doing that. We give as much as we can to the uh, uh, ethnic theaters, I think they call them. And, uh, but whatever they're doing now did not prevent this crisis. And it contributed to it by their neglect of human needs and their overemphasis on the police. So if they're doing something that's working, then we want you to double it. And if you don't know what works, we're gonna suggest this. And uh, we can do a lot of things with all the uh, contacts we have throughout the city. We can do a lot of things like Sarah said earlier about soliciting input from people in various communities. But this is a city that is, being, is made unjust 
by this uh, uh, violent, unaccountable policing. And it's a city that in certain communities has made even more dangerous because of the over-policing and profiling and, and brutality. So the document will get you started on thinking about it and then your own ideas about how to create better communities. We wanna communicate them, we, we wanna hear them and we wanna work directly with the theater groups on this. Uh, because one, we think the arts are very powerful, but two, the, uh, the arts groups that really get after it know the budget process and we wanna tap into that expertise too. Thank but you on so the much. protest, David, I wanna say that uh, I, we encourage them. We encourage the protest, keep going. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I do want to acknowledge another comment by Inclusive Communities Project, which I think is, um, uh, is, is powerful. She said, uh, they say fund the arts and further, um, uh, and furthermore fair housing by investing in affordable housing throughout the entire city. Matthew, can you share screen this, um, this graph of the 2020 expenditures comparing DPD with Office of Homeless Solutions and Housing and Neighborhood Revitalization. So take a look at that. Over half a billion dollars is going to the Dallas Police Department and $12 million is going to the Office of Homeless Solutions and three million uh, plus to Housing and Neighborhood Revitalization. So I know we've been talking a lot about theater right now in the arts, but we're actually looking at massive deficits in all areas of the city. And so when we, when we look at this 10 point plan and we look at the need to reinvest funding from the police into different sectors to support the community, my question is why have our communities been deprived in the first place and for how long? So we've been looking at communities that have been deprived of housing solutions, that we have been deprived of of the arts as well as health solutions. So that's what this vision for divesting from the police provides for us. So I want to thank, um, I want to thank everyone for, for this evening for, for bringing all of this to light. I saw a comment pop up. I want to, um, want to make sure I, I, I read that. Oh yeah, uh, Betsy says, I'm freaking at the Dallas budget priorities graph. That's why I wanted to share it. It's such a powerful one. Well, well, Matthew, if you can also put that in the comment section. So I just want to end um, by um, repeating what we said before, which is our action plan is to send uh, emails to in mass to the mayor and all council members and saying that we support the 10 new directions for public safety and write your own cover letter and tell them what you support. Do you support providing uh, uh, staff for health solutions? Are you looking for to reinvest in contact tracing during the pandemic? Uh, do you want to support housing? Do you want to support the arts? Because this is a vision, and again, which we're giving everyone, um, uh, we, want to we want to give the people of Dallas everything. When we ask ourselves, what do children need to succeed? The answer is everything. And not just some children get everything, everyone. And that's the vision that this 10 point plan has. So um, I wanna give a shout out to Lee Doherty for making that graph uh, because that graph uh, just kind of tells it all. And I believe the arts budget is about 18 million. So, uh, and I know we're looking at cuts next year but this is actually the time for us to establish what the priorities are and that we are prioritizing neighborhoods. I wanna add a couple of things. Sarah put on a question, what aspects, aspects of the cultural plan need funding for implementation? Well, let me, tell, let me tell you one thing about the cultural plan is that it actually does not address specifically racial equity. It has something called cultural equity, which basically is trying to say everyone deserves the arts. Racial equity is actually providing more resources to those groups who have been historically deprived of resources giving them more in, in order to provide more support. And now is the time when our culturally specific black, brown, and uh, indigenous arts groups need uh, financial support by focusing on racial equity. I'd also say supporting the um, funding in the neighborhoods. Right now, the funding in the neighborhoods during the pandemic, as a matter of fact, during the fiscal year, 
has been harder for us to, um, to receive um, for various reasons. So it's important that we tell council we want racial equity to be added into the cultural plan because it isn't right now. And we also want to fund the arts in the neighborhood. So again, uh, I want to thank everyone for being a part of this. I know that John just had to leave, but I want to thank Sarah McCurria um, for uh, being with us tonight and for your commitment to this work. Do you have any final words that you'd like to say? I was just going to say, you know, thank you all so much. This is just the beginning of this conversation. We need to continue the conversation. Uh, a beautiful thing happened. Was it yesterday noon? I think it was late last night or uh, in the afternoon that 10 of the city council members sent a memo to our city manager saying um, that they are looking for a budget that um, defunds um, and reallocates uh, money from uh, public safety and from the police department. And, and they listed the priorities that, uh, to David's point, um, remedy uh, past intentional actions um, that, that uh, furthered segregation and inequities in our community. And so um, we all need to, right now in this moment, imagine uh, what our communities need and want and desire. And then we need to be ready for uh, ready to stand and fight and, and push and by all means necessary with all strategies uh, to make sure that those priorities are reflected in our budget. And I would like to add, uh, I would like to invite, I think Pastor Haynes has had to step off, but I would yes. like to- Yes, he did, um, David. He had um, Bible study, he had Bible study today. Of course, <laughs> that's great. Well, I would like to invite the, the theater companies to uh, provide some last words. And I see Tina Parker there as well from Kitchen Dog Theater. And if you'd like to say a word, some words, uh, I'd invite you to do so um, however you'd like. Uh, so whoever would like to say a, a few last words before we close the conversation. Teresa, you wanna begin? Yes, I just wanna thank everyone for, um, for attending, we, you know, this as emotional as this time is, it's also exciting for me. Many of us have been waiting to have this conversation and reimagine a new sector, a new city, and a new reality for Black and Brown people. And um, I'm a mother of two boys, two Black boys. And so this is personal for me. Um, so I'm just excited to partner with uh, these other black and brown theater companies. And also I'm so grateful that um, to have the audience tonight and, and let's get to work. I, I agree with you, Teresa. It is a really important um, moment when we're all coming together. And I just want to remind everybody that the city of Dallas is actually approaching between our collective communities. We are a majority. So um, while you know we use this term groups of color, the reality is even that terminology is couched as us in relation to the status quo, which has always been white. And the reality is, is that the city is black and brown and indigenous and many and, and, and many other people and it's not reflected in um, the way the services are distributed. So we have to continuously uh, work together now to really remind people of that reality and, um, you know, push our needs to the forefront. Anika, would you like to share anything? How about uh, Tina Parker? Would you like to share anything? Tina Parker from Kitchen Dog. Oh, sorry, I was muted. I, I just wanted to say thanks. Sorry, thank you. And I just, I noticed that Justin posted from DG, DG. I mean, we're with them as far as same, echoing what he's saying right there, as far as, you know, finding 
just we just we're here to listen and figure out you know what 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 I can do and what Kitchen Dog can do to to push this forward because it's important and I just really appreciate you guys hosting this forum. Um, uh, I'm just ready. To, we're ready to do the work. So call on us. We're here. We'll do. We will definitely do that. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Justin, would you like to say anything? Hello. You want to be on there? Okay. Yeah, here we are. Um, thank you so much for having this conversation. Thank you so much for being amazing leaders in this community and uh, for taking a very strong step forward in terms of informing people about what to listen for and what to pay attention to and uh, really allowing Dallas artists who are really all about learning uh, an avenue for learning. So thank you. Yes, thank you guys so much for this. It was really informative and educational. Thank you, you too. I also want to call on uh, a great partner of ours, um, Billy Lane from After Eight to Educate. Uh, Billy, can you tell us a little bit about your organization and how your organization and your field can support this vision, this 10-point plan? Yeah, David, I appreciate it. And uh, hats off always to Sarah and John, uh, Fulham Water and Reverend Haynes. Uh, I really, really appreciate and love the reimagination. Um, and uh, of course, I got to say, I'm a Big fan of uh, Teresa Coleman Walsh. My daughter attended summer camp at uh, Bishop Arts Theater. So big fan of yours. That's right, that's right, <laughs> at all the theaters. Uh, and so after Eight to Educate, we definitely want to uh, talk more with uh, the theater companies and get behind this 10 point uh, vision. Um, ours is directly related again to public safety because we are not a law enforcement organization. We are an organization that provides safe spaces for young people who are who don't have a place to go, particularly in the hours uh, after eight o'clock, which, which is why we're called after eight to educate. Uh, uh, we don't want to see uh, young people walking the street and just trying to find a place in you know, a safe place. We provide that safe place at the Fantasy Harris Youth Center, which is in Fair Park. So uh, David, I definitely want to talk, uh, just continue this conversation. All right, uh, I, I see uh, one more person out there and I wanna give her the opportunity to speak. I see Morgana Wilburn, Director of Education at the Dallas Theater Center. Morgana, do you wanna say anything before we head out? You didn't expect this coming, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna force you, but uh, if you wanna keep your screen, screen name up, it's up to you. But uh, we collaborate a lot with uh, Morgana and Morgana's teaching our high school student leaders in our school of yes. So I wanna thank everybody for being here uh, on this call. I know we went over, but we had a lot of people join the call tonight. And so uh, I just wanna say uh, thank you. And here's my wife, Frida, uh, who's been um, uh, involved in this work for a long time. But again, we wanna get behind uh, the work that um, Sarah is, has been doing. For, uh, for several years. And we also want to acknowledge the um, organization that, um, that, that she has begun, Our City, Our Future. This is very important that we connect with Our City, Our Future. This forum was meant to connect our, our, our constituents and our networks into this conversation that Sarah has been having for several years that is coming through the 10 point plan but Sarah has also begun Our City, Our Future, which is a, an activist organization that is advocating for this change. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, oh, I can't, uh, I appreciate um, credit and praise, um, you know, and applause, but um, I can't take credit for Our City, Our Future. It, it really is a collaborative effort of um, indigenous, Black, Latinx, uh, women and gender non-conforming people who have all come together. And so, it, you know, I, I, I am just a, a, a co-lead amongst uh, a wonderful and amazing people. And um, this last week, you know, to also be in uh, collaboration with the um, Coalition 
that's called in defense of black lives. There are so many, there's so much work that's happening and I have been working on this for a long time, but I've been working in partnership with people like you all and with people like them. And so um, I, I believe that this moment belongs to all of us. Thank you so much, Sarah. Well, I wanna thank everyone who's been involved in, in this. I wanna thank our, our guests, of course, and, and the theater companies. And this will continue. Um, Katamiya and the partner, partnering theaters will continue to communicate out and stay connected with Our City, Our Future and Mothers Against Police Brutality. And there are several organizations and people out there working on this. So this is gonna take a citywide effort. So uh, it's, it's time to really uh, ramp this up. And uh, so thank you all for being a part of this and stay in touch. Have a good night. Thank you, David. Thank good night. you. Good night.